Hello, hello everyone. I am Alice of KHR Arts and Cloud Orchid Publishing. And today we are going to talk about the custom formatting that we created for Geisha Hands. First and foremost, the link is in the description below for my video, How I Wrote Geisha Hands. So all the inspiration and the nitty gritty information all about that book is in that video if you want to give it a watch. In this video, I'm going to jump off of that and talk about the very specific detail of how exactly my co-editor and my business partner and my best friend, Brian Thompson of Cloud Orchid Publishing, helped me to create the custom formatting that ultimately became Geisha Hands. First and foremost, Geisha Hands is a combination of writing and artwork. I did all of the writing and I did all of the illustrations for this story. I first wrote the manuscript, so I wrote all the text, and in that text I also had a lot of footnotes and I also created a glossary where I further defined and discussed those footnotes. So already we have some custom formatting in all of this written information that I've created for this historical fiction novel. On top of that, I also include 47 color illustrations. And these illustrations come in different formats and sizes. I have some illustrations that are perfect squares. I have some that are vertical rectangles. And then I have some that are the horizontal landscape rectangles. All of that means for some custom formatting. Because first of all, artwork aside, this book is going to require custom formatting just with the footnotes and the glossary, which already with that, many publishers are not exactly going to want to deal with that. With publishing, part of that is the layout design. And I talk about that in my video, The Business of Self-Publishing, which you can also find a link in the description below. That in mind, I already knew that this book was going to need some heavy lifting in the layout design department, and that is specifically Brian's department. He handles all of the layout design for our books in Cloud Orchid Publishing. What that means is there's a program called InDesign. It is in the Adobe suite. There's also other programs out there as well as there are services that help do it for you. But that's particularly what we use for Cloud Orchid Publishing. It's a program that if I took the time, I'm sure I could learn it. But the fact of the matter is, is that Brian is an absolute pro at it. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> Brian and I had to really put our heads together to figure out the customization of the formatting for Geisha Hands. And it took us three solid months of experimenting in order to come up with the final formatting that we have in the book today. And how we dealt with that was first we handled the text. We didn't even worry about the images. We were handling just the text. And we were trying to figure out how exactly we wanted to organize the footnotes. So not even worrying about the glossary yet, just the footnotes. In some texts, and I say text because not necessarily just novels, but also like textbooks and other journalistic, scientific sort of texts. They all present information in different ways and format the text in different ways. We explored a few different options with that. The two most general things being that we tried to decide on is, did we want the footnote to be included right there where the word is in the text, or did we want it to be at the bottom of the page? And the reason why we had to explore that option is because on some of the pages, we have a lot of footnotes. We have like a huge, like two inches worth of the bottom of the page are footnotes. And that's a lot of real estate on the page. So trying to figure out how we wanted to organize that so that everything is readable and everything is accessible because we don't want to have it where, okay, this word that has a footnote on page 26, we don't want the actual footnotes to be on page 27 just because we ran out of room at the bottom to put it. There was a lot of shuffling around to make sure that all of those footnotes were readable and accessible. The other part of it was the readability, was making sure that the font size was readable, but also so that the footnotes were not distracting 
from the story text itself. So figuring out those different sizings, the different fonts, the specific formatting. Did we want it to be in italics? Did we want it to be bold? Did we want it to be in a different font style? Whatever, all of those different aspects are things that we experimented with in this phase of the formatting. Once we had that down, then we decided how exactly we were going to organize the glossary information. And this was also a big decision was, did we want to put it all in the back as one big thing? Or did we want to intersperse it through the book and have it be okay, page 26 is the story, page 27 is a glossary page about some stuff and then turn the page and there's more story. We had to go through all that and figure out how exactly we wanted to present that. What was, again, going to make for the best readability as well as the most accessibility and making it easy to access the information. What we ended up doing was I actually had to make two separate glossaries. Oh my God, y'all, this is part of why it took so long was this was such a painful process. And I had to edit this with a fine tooth comb several times to make sure that everything was correct. It was a true labor of love, y'all. What I had to do was go through the entire manuscript and I had to collect all of the footnotes that appeared and put them in order of appearance. So on page one, this footnote, that footnote, blah, 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 so that we could put all of those at the bottom of the page. Then for the glossary, we decided to make it in alphabetical order because one of the things that Brian brought up was he's like, okay, it's all fine and dandy if we have order of appearance footnote stuff. But let's say at the very beginning of the story, I say the word shamisen. And then on page 100, they see the word shamisen again, and they're like, I don't remember what that is. And I need to look in the back of the book to find out what that is again. By page 100, they don't remember what number footnote that word is anymore. How do they find it without looking through every single footnote in the glossary? And it's 40 pages of glossary, y'all. Nobody is going to look through that to find a, a specific thing that way. It's just not feasible. I had to come up with then ordering all of them alphabetically in the glossary. And then I also additionally, next to the footnote word or phrase, put the number so that also the number of appearance is there too, so that for whatever reason, accessibility, so that they can find it easily, alphabetical order, as well as it's in there in order of appearance so that they can jump back into the book and see where that word first appears in the book and the context and all that good stuff. And that was a huge amount of effort making those two lists of order appearance and alphabetically. It was a ton of work, y'all. It was just so much organization, figuring all of that out. It was, at times my brain hurt from being confused, looking at all these words repeatedly. It was nuts. The next thing was figuring out, again, the footnotes at the bottom of the page and the amount of space they took up. Brian figured out how many characters was the optimal amount of space we wanted each footnote to take up so that each one only took up one line of space at the bottom of the page so that we didn't have all of these hanger off and too many inches of space at the bottom of the page of just footnotes. So then I had to go back to all my lists of the footnotes and if it was just one word, great, easy, fine. But if it was like a phrase or a definition or something, I had to sit there and count the characters. And I say characters meaning the letters, the punctuation, and the spaces. So like any periods, commas, quotation marks, the spaces after a period, the spaces in between words, all of that counted as a character and I had to count all those out. And then I had to send a document to Brian where it was that entire list of all of the footnotes, how they were going to appear at the bottom of the page. And that meant that with some of the phrases, it was just part of the phrase and then an ellipsis that then they knew it continued on in the glossary. And I had to also count those ellipses as characters too for the amount of space they take up. That was a ton of work too, y'all. Sitting there counting out all those characters. And then I know it was a ton of work for Brian to then take all those things I was sending him and plugging those all into that manuscript document. It was a lot of work on both of our parts. It was just a massive amount of work. Then, <laughs> there's so much and then, 
Then with organizing the glossary, we had to determine how exactly we wanted the spacing to be and how exactly we wanted to have it organized for better readability. Again, we had already decided on alphabetical order. So it was pretty easy that we decided to categorize it where we would have A and then all the A's and then B and then all the B's. We actually like organized it that way so that we have the different letters. It's all nice and organized, it's easy to find things that way. And then also the spacing. Spacing out between the different entries so that it's not just one giant big blob of text. Also with the way that some of the text is presented with different diagrams and different, and different references, whether it's things that I lifted from actual historical texts or other works, things like that, the way that I wanted that to be included in there so that you could know the difference between this is my writing and this is bibliography time and all that. All of that organization, y'all, went into there. That was another thing we had to decide on. The bibliography. The bibliography for Geisha Hands is also pretty massive. Just the entire list of all the resources that I used to research for that book. And we had to decide whether or not we wanted to include it in Geisha Hands. And at the end of the day, we chose not to include the full bibliography because it was just a lot y'all and that's why i have it where on my website it says that if you really want to see the bibliography i can make that available to you personally but it's not something that we're just going to have like here you go because it's just massive it's just a ridiculous amount of information and resources and honestly 90 percent of people just don't care which is, again, sometimes you have to decide what information to leave out just so that your readers aren't overwhelmed by the sheer amount of stuff. Last but not least, how we organized the images in Geisha Hands. Oh man, y'all, this was the part that was just the most work, I think, anyway, was I, as I said, I finished the manuscript writing and we put together all of that writing with the glossary and the footnotes and all of that. And then I started on the illustrations. Now, while I was writing the story and while we were doing some of the layout, I did actually start on some of the illustrations, but that was more so because I was just kind of like, oh, I'm interested in drawing this thing for the story and blah, blah, blah. I didn't really get on my kick of, I am drawing all the things systematically until after all of the writing and formatting was done with the actual manuscript. And that actually made formatting the images a lot easier. And the reason for that is what me and Brian ended up coming up with was that we had two types of images that appear in Geisha Hands. The first one is what I call the story illustrations. These are full page illustrations, so they take up an entire page. It doesn't matter if they are a vertical rectangle or if they are a horizontal landscape rectangle they take up the whole page. And what that means as a story illustration is that it is a scene from the story. The emphasis on it is that it's something that's happening in the story to give you better visuals of what things look like. Reference illustrations were the other type of illustration. And those were the ones that were done as a square typically. Some of them were done as rectangles, but most of them were done as squares, and that was on purpose. And they are fitted on the page with the text. So the text goes around these reference images. And the reason for that is the reference images are the textbook images. These are the ones where it is literally cut and paste as textbook as you can get. This is this thing. This is this concept as historically, culturally accurate down to the detail as I honestly could physically possibly create for y'all was what that was. It's a visual explanation of something for the reader. And it usually had a little footnote that went under it to explain to you what that reference image was referencing. It was usually something to do with something on that page. So for example, in Geisha Hands, there is a scene where the main character Yuki is performing traditional tea ceremony. During that part of the story, there are reference images in the text of the different tools that are used in tea ceremony. Because in the book, I reference all of these tools and she's doing all sorts of things with the tools. But as a Westerner who is not familiar with tea ceremony, 
you probably have no idea what those two tools are and it's probably very hard for you to visualize what exactly she's doing. So that's why I drew these pictures where it's literally here is a picture and here is this tool and here is that tool and blah 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 so that I can show you what they all look like to give you a better visual understanding of what is going on in the story. So that was the purpose behind those illustrations. And basically what we did at that point was I read through the manuscript again and I decided what were all of the reference illustrations that I needed to create like those tea ceremony tools what are all of the items and concepts that I need to illustrate that I know most readers are probably not going to understand are probably not going to be able to visualize through text alone I made a list of all those things and I listed where they should appear in the story so I went down to on page blah 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 this is where this illustration should be because we're talking about this specific thing, so we should have the illustration there. And then I went through it again, decided, okay, what are the scenes in this story that I really particularly want to illustrate? What are the scenes that I really want the reader to actually visually see in the story and not just leave up to reading the text and visualizing in their head? What do I actually want to bring to life for them through pictures? And so I made a list of that. And then of course, again, this has to be on page blah 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 because it has to do with that particular scene that's happening in that part of the story. And doing that made it a lot easier for Brian to create the final formatting for the book because once we figured out, here's the master list of all the illustrations I'm going to complete and this is where they're all going to go in the story, then he was able to create this shell where he had all the text and then he literally just left these little placeholders in all the spaces where the illustrations needed to be on each page. And then as I completed the illustrations, I sent them to Brian and then he would replace the placeholder with the illustration that I sent him. And it was really fun to watch the book grow in that way because then every few weeks he would send me an updated PDF where I could look over it and see okay, here's these placeholders, but then these are the illustrations I've finished and they're already plugged in. Part of that was also to make sure that it was still visually presenting the way that we wanted, to make sure that everything is where it goes, the illustrations are on the right pages, all that good stuff. And it was just such a beautiful part of the process to be able to physically see the book grow with fewer and fewer placeholders and more and more of the illustrations plugged in. And that's what made that final illustration when I did the last illustration in the book. That was just such a sweet moment because then once that was plugged in the book was done y'all <laughs> and you authors know y'all know how sweet that is when you finally are like the book is done oh best feeling y'all best feeling in the world well the best feeling in the world is finally holding your book and when i finally held geisha hands in my hand oh man i i i like cried y'all i was just like it's a book oh my god <laughs> But yeah, I just wanted to share with y'all, that is the whole process that went into formatting Geisha Hands, which was a, as you could tell, a whole process in itself beyond even writing the story and doing all the research for the story. It was a ton of work, and that's why I explain to people why self-publishing isn't just because you want to bypass red tape or just because you want to get your book out there faster, sometimes it has to do with really mechanical reasons in how exactly the book is created and how it's different from a traditional book. In every sense of that phrase, I hope this has been helpful. I hope this has given you a better appreciation and understanding of the works that I've created and the works that I am currently creating and going to be releasing into the world, hopefully in the near future. I wanna thank y'all so much for watching. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a like. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please do subscribe. Thank y'all so much. Take care. Bye-bye.